Corey Davis is returning to the NFL, but maybe not the Jets. If that confuses you, I'll explain it today on Locked On Jets. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Friday, March 15th, 2024, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. Subscribe to the show for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, so you'll get new episodes as soon as they're posted. If you enjoy the show and are listening on a podcast, course, please give it a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube and enjoy the show, give this episode a big thumbs up. It helps us out, helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. Well, the offseason continues to roll on. A relatively uneventful Thursday for the New York Jets, but one somewhat big development in wide receiver Corey Davis coming out of retirement. You may remember Davis, a free agent signing by the Jets in 2021. He signed a three-year contract with the team. Then last summer, after... You know, right before the start of the third season, the final year of that contract, he announced his retirement. It happened in August. It was, you know, it was unexpected at the time. And ever since then, there's been speculation that maybe he was going to return to the league. Maybe he was going to return to the Jets. Um, you know, there was even, there's even been reports that if the Jets were in playoff position last year, it was understood that like maybe in November, or December, he was going to come out of retirement to try and help the team. Despite what I just said, there's no guarantee he's returning to the Jets. So the Jets are actually releasing him, which will make him an unrestricted free agent able to sign with any team, including the Jets. There's been some rumors that maybe the Jets are, are going to be interested in a reunion, but at a lower price. So you, you may be very confused by all of this. So I'm going to try and explain this in terms that are as simple as possible, because this is a very complex situation. When Davis retired, the Jets placed him on what's known as the reserve retired list. And what that meant is that Davis's contract essentially paused. Now, the Jets, because he was retiring, there was a little bit of a dead money hit. The Jets were hit with like, I don't know, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars in dead money last year. But aside from that, Douglas, with uh, aside from that, Davis leaves the salary cap for the Jets. His contract did not count against the, the cap. Obviously, the Jets did not have to pay him because he was no longer a player. But by placing him on that list, the reserve retired list, it's a it's a list you can place players who have retired. It meant that Davis's contract essentially remained it was just kind of like they hit the pause button on it and if he ever on retired the contract would then pick up from where it left off and davis has it had last year what would have been a salary of 10.5 million dollars so you may be wondering do the jets save any money by cutting davis and the answer is well kind of so it does not like create new cap space for the jets but because of the dynamics that i laid out because Davis's contract would have unpaused, that would have become a $10.5 million cap hit that would have been added to the Jets cap. And because they're re releasing him, they know they do not have to add that $10.5 million to their cap. And, you know, you may wonder why, why did the Jets uh, place Davis on that list if they were just going to cut him? I don't think they knew he, they were going to cut him if he came out of retirement. Again, last year there was talk that if the Jets were, com were competitive, Davis was going to come out of retirement and try and help them for the stretch run. So the Jets wanted to retain his rights. Um, you know, a similar situation, obviously a player that had far more significance, Brett Favre, um, the Jets, when Favre retired, the Jets placed him on the same list. And then once the Jets drafted Mark Sanchez, they released Favre. And that's how Favre got to Minnesota. He became a free agent only after the Jets released him. And the reason the Jets did that was the Jets drafted Sanchez, and it was in the days before the rookie wage scale. So Sanchez essentially was paid like a franchise quarterback the day he was drafted. And the Jets could not, have, if Jets were said, you know what, if Favre comes out of retirement, our cap's going to be ruined. So we asked that we just have to cut Favre. So that's essentially the situation. There are reports that the Jets could potentially be interested in a Davis reunion. And I tend to agree with the Jets. I just think $10.5 million is too much money. Now, if you're a longtime listener, you know that like I, I never was as hard on Corey Davis as a lot of people were. I don't think Davis was necessarily a great signing. I think he was in many ways a disappointing signing. But I felt like the dialogue around Davis was not entirely fair. I remember thinking that, you know, Davis was an okayish receiver. He was a guy who 
produced around an 800 yard pace with the Jets. You know, if you look at his his track record with the team, he had a lot of really bad games. He had a lot of really bad drops. He had a lot of really bad moments. He also struggled to stay on the field. I mean, he missed a lot of games due to injuries, and you know, injuries aren't necessarily the player's fault. But you know, there's the old saying: the best sort of ability is availability. But people treated him like he was Alan Lazard. I remember last year, like Jets fans were like really fired up about signing Lazard. And I think it was just because like they they viewed him as a guy that wasn't Corey Davis, and like anybody who's not Corey Davis must be better. Jets fans were way too hard on Corey Davis. I maintain that to the end. He was a decent starting receiver, may not have been like the greatest value for what the Jets paid for him, but wasn't like a total black hole. And he had some very good games with this team. Now that said, I don't think Corey Davis solves your problems at wide receiver if you're the Jets. Because first of all, you know, he wasn't that great. But second of all, there's always a risk when a guy misses a full season. So if you're going to tell me that Corey Davis can come back as the number two receiver, I'm going to say the Jets did not do a good enough job with the wide receiver position this offseason. And that's even last year, I remember distinctly saying, you know what? I understand that like the Jets are trying to upgrade the receiver position, but you got to do better than Corey Davis or Alan Lazard. People acted like it was neither or. It's like they signed Lazard. It's like, okay, well, he's he's an upgrade on Davis. But of course he was not. But the point is that you should be trying to do better than both Davis and Lazard. I think the Jets should be open to a Davis return at the right price, you know, at a low price. If he's going to be like a supporting player, if he's going to be like, you know, the the fourth option in the passing game, that's that's a roll of the dice you can take at like, I don't know, five, four or five million dollars, about half the price. You know, that, that's the type of deal I can live with. But I think going into the season, counting on Corey Davis to be like one of your top two options, that would be very risky. And I think it would be a mistake for the New York Jets. So, you know, I think given the situation, I think it was right for the Jets to place him on the reserve retired list. But I think, you know, that was that was under a different context. You know, there was there were scenarios where Davis returned where it would have made a lot of sense for the New York Jets to keep him around at his ten point five million dollar salary. I don't think $10.5 million makes sense for the team in its current state. And I think, you know, part of it's the Jets are very tight up against the cap right now. Even still, they did make a move yesterday we're going to get to that may help uh, with their cap situation a bit. But I, I look at the situation and I say to, to myself, you know what, uh, Corey Davis is fine. You know, listen, he'd be better. He'd be, be better than like having Randall Cobb out there, but you still need more. If the Jets just bring back Corey Davis this offseason, this wide receiver group is just not good enough behind Garrett Wilson. Look, it's going to be better with Corey Davis than it will be with Lazard or Cobb. I mean, that I'm pretty confident in, even after a year away from, from the NFL. I do think Corey Davis is still going to be an upgrade in, in some respects for the New York Jets if he comes back. But, you know, just I don't think he's the right guy if we're talking about, you know, we keep talking about the Jets need to, to improve the, the group behind Garrett Wilson. If that's all you're doing, I don't think you've done a good enough job. So uh, it's one of those things, I think it's one of those situations where absence makes the heart grow fonder because a lot of people who are very critical of Corey Davis a year ago are now saying, oh, Corey Davis is going to be back. He's going to fix the team. And I don't know that's necessarily true. And I think like maybe a year of Alan Lazard has gotten people to appreciate what Corey Davis brings to the table a little bit more. But if, if a year ago you were saying you wanted Corey Davis off the team, I don't think you could turn around today and say Corey Davis is going to be the savior for this wide receiver position. The head here on the Locked On Jets podcast, we'll turn our attention to some other Jets news. As I mentioned, there was a contract restructure yesterday. Or actually, it was really more of a contract extension. There are a couple other rumors out there around Jets players. We'll break them all down as we continue on this Friday edition of Locked On Jets. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Robinhood Retirement. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risks, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA, available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. 
Thank you so much for making Lockdown Jets your first listener or first watch every day. A big shout out to you, Everydayers. This is a daily podcast covering the New York Jets. We have new episodes each day through the week, Monday through Friday. Jets cleared out some salary cap space yesterday by extending the contract of linebacker C.J. Mosley, who feels like this contract has been redone so many times. It feels like he's going to be with the Jets until he's you know in his 70s or 80s. But in terms of the deal, it's a two-year contract extension. It essentially rips up the old contract. Uh, the deal is worth 17 point. Two five million dollars. So, so I look at this. It's going to clear up. I, you know, some the estimates right now are somewhere in the neighborhood of thirteen to fourteen million dollars in salary cap space. I look at the situation and I say, okay. In a perfect world, I would not want to like extend a linebacker for multiple years who's thirty two years old. But we don't have. We're, we're not in a perfect world. We're in a world with the Jets where they've painted themselves into a corner where they have a bunch of imperfect solutions. And I have to say, you know, if they were going to redo the Mosley deal, this was a pretty good way to do it because it's seventeen point two five million over two years, and it, again, it rips up the old contract. His current his current contract had him making like seventeen million dollars as a base salary this year. So instead of seventeen million dollars this year, it's seventeen point two five over two years. So really, you only added like a quarter million dollars of new money. Essentially, what you're doing is you're taking this year's salary and you're stretching it out over the course of two seasons. So I think it's a tough, you know, it's tough for me to get upset with this. It, I think this is actually like a pretty decent deal for the Jets. Now, it guarantees Mosley's going to be here in 2025. And again, I don't love the idea of a 32-year-old linebacker, you know, extending extending him for multiple seasons. But, you know, a couple things about that. First of all, Mosley's playing at a high level. I thought he just had his best season with the Jets. And I think a lot of it has to do with Quincy Williams' emergence. Uh, Quincy Williams had an outstanding season, made first-team All-Pro as a linebacker. And his breakout season, I think, allowed Mosley to do the things, to focus on the things C.J. Mosley does really well. You know, C.J. Mosley, Robert Sala's system requires linebackers to cover a lot of ground. And that's not really C.J. Mosley's game. I never really thought of him as a sideline-to-sideline -side linebacker, even though, you know, he's kind of adjusted. You know, he's, he, he drops some weight to try and get faster. But Mosley is a guy who, you know, he's a downhill guy. He plays the run really well. He fills the right gaps. He also brings a lot of intangibles to the table. This guy who makes sure everybody's in the right spot on defense. You know, he knows the system inside and out, makes sure that the defense gets lined up correctly. He's also an outstanding locker room guy. You know, a guy who's been voted captain consistently with the Jets. Everybody raves about him. And personally, like I love CJ Mosley because he did an interview with me a few years ago on the show. It was actually, absolutely one of the best interviews I've ever had. Great guy. Um, you know, a lot to like about him. And, you know, you look at this and, Okay, it's not bad. It's really it's and how many times over the couple last couple of years have you been listening? I have, have I said I'd love to have CJ Mosley at half his salary. Well, they just cut his salary in half. You know, they went from seventeen million to just over eight and a half million. So we're getting him at a more palatable salary. You know, my biggest issue with with Mosley wasn't Mosley; it was the contract. The contract was a total albatross when Mike McCagnan signed it to him. Signed him to it in twenty nineteen. You know, Mosley was a you know, a guy who was a good linebacker, but He's always a second. You know, he's a guy who made the Pro Bowl. He was a second team All Pro, but he was never the best linebacker in the NFL. And Jets made him one of the top five defensive players, defensive top five defensive paid players in the league. You know, he was paid more than most edge rushers. He was paid more, more than most shutdown corners. It was a crazy contract. We've got the contract now at a more reasonable rate. So, you know, I think that this is to the extent that Jets had a bunch of imperfect solutions. This one was pretty good, and he keeps Mosley here, a guy who. You know, the coaching staff loves, everybody loves him. The, the team loves him. Guy who's just, again, just had his best season with the Jets. Just, and again, I think a lot of it's Quincy. Quincy Williams can now cover all the ground. Mosley can can do this, the CJ Mosley stuff. It's like a good partnership that the pieces fit really well. So uh, good move, I, I think. There's also rumors the Jets are trying to trade Alan Lazard. I mean, yeah, sure. They're trying to trade Alan Lazard. I mean, I, you're gonna how many, how long are, are you gonna have another GM on the phone? I mean, the the, the other GM when when Joe Douglas calls these other GMs and says I want to trade Alan Lazard, they're gonna hang up immediately. I mean, I mean, what's gonna happen? Or maybe maybe they'll say well, we have a bunch of old, used shoulder pads we're we're thinking of throwing out. Maybe we'll send you that for Lazard. It's gonna be very difficult to trade Alan Lazard. Um, you know, I, I got. I'm sure the Jets would love to get rid of him. It's also like I'd love it. I'd love the Jets to trade Lazard in part because Lazard's terrible, in part because you just end that contract, you turn the page on this. But I'd also like it from the standpoint that the Jets have been so deferential to Rodgers in these personnel moves the last 
couple last year that I, I would just like the, the the idea that you know Rogers is a player, Rogers is not the GM. So I, I'd like I'd like the Jets to be able to trade Lazard from that standpoint. And you know if you trade Lazard and bring Corey Davis back at a cheaper contract, look the Jets still need some help at the wide receiver position, even with Corey Davis around. And by the way, you know, time is really starting to run out the receiver position. I said the first couple of days of the week, you know, we still have time. There's still plenty of good players available. Well, a lot of the good players are going off the board now. I mean, we're looking at the receiver position. Hollywood Brown signed with Kansas City yesterday. Um, other guys, you know, a lot of other guys have, have kind of gone off the boards. At the time we're recording this podcast, the only guys who I think are, are, would really help the Jets who are available are Mike Williams, formerly of the Chargers, who I think would be a perfect fit, comes with a lot of injury concerns. You know, that it's going to be a roll of the dice if you get Mike Williams, but on paper, he would fit exactly what the New York Jets need. And the other guy is Tyler Boyd, who's just a good slot receiver. I don't think Boyd's enough, though. Like, I honestly think we're to the point where Jets need to go get Mike Williams because we're almost out of time. You know, I, I, I've been telling you that the first couple of days of the week, you know, relax. There's a lot of dumb money being spent the first couple of days of free agency. Sometimes the market settles and you get good deals. I told you. I would let you know when it was time to panic. It's not time to panic yet, but it's time to get a little concerned because the Jets have not been active enough at the wide receiver position. And now the the, the guys who are good are starting to go off the board. Now the, the selection is becoming very limited when we're talking about options at the wide receiver position for this team. So the Jets need to make a move quickly at the receiver position. Now, one good move would be get rid of Lazard. You know, if we get we send Lazard packing, that that that's addition by subtraction. But you know, the, the options are starting to dwindle. Now, it's always possible, you know, nobody thought Morgan Moses was going to be available when we're talking about the right tackle position. It's also possible that, you know, maybe there's some receiver we're not aware of who's going to be put on the trade block. And, of course, I know the draft is still there, but you don't want to go into the draft absolutely des- desperately needing a position. That's not a good spot to be in. So it's time for the Jets to make a move at the receiver position. They've just cleared out some cap space with Mosley. Maybe they can get some some more. Maybe they can get, get rid of Lazard and not, not use up that, that roster spot. But it, it's time for the Jets to make a move at the receiver position. Now, head on the Lockdown Jets podcast, we'll turn our attention to a guy who left the New York Jets, is a former fifth-round pick in 2020, and maybe the last member of that class who had a reasonable chance of returning to that team. And it just makes you reflect on why the Jets are in the situation they're in now. I'll go into that in more detail as we continue this Friday edition of Lockdown Jets. This episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. Again, that's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Exciting weekend in college hoops. The conference tournaments are underway. They're kicking into high gear this weekend, but that's just the appetizer. Next week, March Madness begins. You'll fill out your bracket, obviously, but if you're like me, your picks will probably all be gone by the end of the first weekend. Well, again, on FanDuel, you can bet on every single game, so even if your bracket busts, you can win. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Again, it's FanDuel.com slash locked on, and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Friday, We're talking about the offseason, which has gotten underway this week. Jets have made a few moves. They've also lost a couple of players. They lost uh, Bryce Huff early on in the week. On Friday morning, news broke that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have agreed to terms with cornerback Bryce Hall, who you know, was not expected to stick around, but there was a scenario where maybe Hall did not have the market he wanted and maybe the Jets could have retained him to be a backup corner. And Bryce Hall's departure makes it very likely that no members of the New York Jets 2020 draft class will receive a second contract with this team. It's possible, you know, Ashton Davis could come back. The reports are that Ashton Davis is probably not coming back because Ashton Davis is seeking a starting job. Now, it's also very possible that nobody wants to give Ashton Davis a starting job. Ashton Davis had, had a good season in 2023, but it was in a part-time role where the Jets kind of used him in a very specialized way. That's, you know, succeeding in that role is very different from being able to succeed as a starting safety. So you know, maybe there's an outside chance Ashton Davis comes back. Maybe there's even a really, really outsized chance Mekhi Becton comes back if like the market completely falls out for Becton. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't count on that just because like um, the league is in such has such short short supply of tackles that I feel like somebody's just going to roll the dice on Becton's pedigree as a former top eleven overall pick. But realistically, nobody's coming back from the 2020 draft class. In fact, you could include Huff in the 2020 draft class, but now we know he's not coming back. So the Jets have retained Huff. You can at least make an argument that maybe you know we maybe 
one player succeeded from this class, but you know, probably the most, again, the most realistic guy is Davis. And if you could bring Davis back, that would mean you had one member of this draft class come back as a backup. And that's simply not good enough. And, you know, when we talk about the job Joe Douglas is doing, that's a pretty big red flag with Douglas that his first draft class, and it takes a couple of years to evaluate it. And, you know, back in 2020, at the end of that first, at the end of the 2020 season, when everybody was a rookie, people were kind of, people were really praising it because back then it held up okay as a left tackle. Denzel Mims had flashed a little bit the second half of that season. Even Hall had gotten some starting, some starting experience. Braden Mann was the punter. You know, at, at the time, it, after the first year, it looked pretty decent. But as frequently happens, the first year, you know, you have low expectations. Maybe guys clear the low bar, but it's a question of can you guys sustain it? And we look at the situation the Jets are in right now. Part of the reason they're in such a tough spot is this draft class. And we've talked about this for years. You know, when Joe Douglas first started, you know, I preached patience because I said, you know what? The Jets have whiffed on draft after draft after draft under Mike McCagnan. So it's good. it was going to take time for Douglas to build up the roster. You have to be patient. Well, now I've been patient. We're in 2024. His first draft class has now reached the end of the rookie contracts. And it's looking like not one of those players is good enough to bring back. You know, if you look at Douglas's second draft class, I mean, Zach Wilson's second overall. We know he's gone. Elijah Moore's already gone. Maybe Elijah Vera Tucker can help salvage it a little bit. Michael Carter II is a very good slot corner, but, you know, Michael Carter I is gone. And 20, Douglas's drafting is not looking very good right now. We, Of course, we have the 2022 class, which was an exceptional class, one of the best draft classes in, in franchise history. Yes, that's true. That's fair. Douglas did a good job getting four top 40 picks in that class. You know, hit looks like he went four for four in those, but you know, that's one class. And overall, I think you have to look at this draft record right now. And I think the reason that like this really stands out to me is Hall leaving kind of puts the kind of kind of puts the, the class into focus. And now we can look at this from like a 30,000 foot view. And we can see that, you know, look at the holes on the roster right now. I mean, there's a huge hole at the tackle position. That's what you get when you whiff on Makai Becton. There's a huge hole at the wide receiver position. Their second round pick that year was Denzel Mims. You know, it's not an accident that the Jets, the Jets have their most glaring needs at positions they absolutely whiffed at in the NFL draft. And you, you go to the second year quarterback. We know, we know the situation the Jets are in at quarterback. We know that all the moves they've had to make over the last year, um, bringing in Aaron Rodgers and then you know filling in with guys Rodgers wanted. Well, it's because they missed on Zach Wilson. You know, again, wide receiver, they have a big hole. They missed on Elijah Moore. It's just not good enough. And, you know, we can focus on a lot of things. But this offseason, the Jets just entered it with too many holes. And we talked about it, how it was going to be tough. And, you know, people, the offseason, the Jets, unfortunately, they were kind of set up for failure because they did not manage their cap well over the last couple of years. And they have not drafted well enough. So when you have too many holes and not enough cap space, that's what brings doom. It's not you know, the Jets were going to have a really just going to be really hard pressed to fix all their problems with their team. And over the course of one off season, it's the type of thing that you focus on, you focus on the immediate, but I don't think we focus enough on how we got here and we got here getting, getting to this point was, was a multi-year process. You know, this is not about just missing out in the 2024 off season. When you have as many glaring holes as the Jets have at the premium positions, it's not easy to, it, you know, if the Jets just went into this off season with like uh, with a hole at right tackle and that was in, that was the only issue they had at the premium spots. Then you could make a trade for Morgan Moses and everything's fixed. Even a good trade, like the one the Jets made for Moses, that only gets you really a fraction of the way to where you need to get. And with the Jets cap situation, with their with the troubles that they have even after the Mosley extension, that's how you get here. You know, it, we've, everybody's, everybody's going nuts now about Douglas. Oh, Douglas isn't signing enough guys. You know, this is a longer term deal. You can't really build an entire team over the course of one offseason. And the fact that Jets need to build as much as they do is a testament to Douglas's failures. And Douglas's failures, we can start to look at this. We can now really start to evaluate his draft classes. And I think we, we can start to say that what Douglas has been doing in the draft is not good enough. And you know, we've that first year, we saw a lot of the traits that Vin Douglas that have led to disappointments where he banks too much on athleticism over the ability to play. And there's look, there are some teams that do very well scouting athletic players. Douglas is clearly not a guy who can figure out which athletic guy can we develop. You know, it's just not good enough for the New York Jets. And yeah, you can go feel free to go crazy about what the Jets have done or not done this offseason, but understand that the issues with this franchise 
have built over a much longer period. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Lockdown Jets podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you enjoy the show and you're listening on a podcast source, please give it a five-star review. And if you're watching on YouTube and enjoy the show, give this episode a big thumbs up. Helps us out. Helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll be back next week to talk more Jets.